Okay, so I know that Pangea is like, P Pangea and ice bridges are the two main ways in which a species will travel uh, to an island. I mean, that, that's how we get a majority of lizard species and uh, of lizard and insect species on, on different islands. But I always wondered, what if a species has to go there after Pangea or after ice bridges? What if they're too late to the party? to get that sort of invitation, uh, so to speak. Now, I know there are many ways in which a species can do this. There's always the classic method of, uh, of how invasive species are usually carried from place to place. When a species is brought by settlers via a boat, like dandelions, for instance, the non-native, non-invasive flowers brought to the Americas by European settlers. Or cats. We all know about cats who are everywhere. <laughs> Keep your cats indoors, etc. We're not gonna get into that yet, but once in a while there's a very special set of circumstances where a species gets their free ticket to an island out of the blue. Usually, nine times out of ten, without their intention or want or desire or even knowledge, just like that of the Fiji Crested Iguana, also known as Brachylophus vitiensis and in Fijian as Vokai, or as some Fijian tribes call them, Samuri. There's a genetic link between the Fiji crested iguana and the genus of desert iguanas called Dipsosaurus. If you live in Mexico or United States or a few places in Central America, then you've probably seen them before. The genetic link that they have suggests to researchers that a little over 34 million years ago, their common ancestor somehow started out on Mexico and went all the way to Fiji. Now before you ask, Pangea ended 175 million years ago, with Fiji itself forming by volcanic activity 150 million years ago. Uh, so <laughs> at least we know that they made the journey after the continent split, because otherwise there would be no Fiji for them to arrive at. It just so happens that the debate on how Fiji crested iguanas specifically got there has been spanning a long time between herpetologists and gets quite heated at some points. There are a few prevailing theories, but the clearest or most concise or most logical, in my opinion, uh, would be one specific one. That theory would be that the iguanas drifted across the ocean on some sort of uh, raft or raft-like object, debris, if you will. Yeah. Okay, I know this is kind of crazy. The most realistic theory is that an iguana just so happened to sail 8,000 kilometers, one-fifth of the world's entire diameter, just by accident, on a raft. I know. I know it sounds more realistic, more normal, more probable that maybe settlers brought Dipsosaurus over uh, to Fiji when Fiji was colonized by European settlers, you know? Maybe that happened more recently, because that was definitely after Pangea, as we all know. And that does sound more normal, for sure. But consider this. Fiji was first occupied by the Lapita people around 1500 or 1000 BCE, or before Common Era. The Lapita people were a Neolithic Austronesian people migrating from around Papua New Guinea, where the Fiji crested iguana has as far as I know, no common ancestors. There is a theory that the original iguanas migrated from Southeastern Asia. We have actual evidence that suggests otherwise. So we know for sure that their migration was not aided in any way by colonization, because both the Lapita people and the British settlers from the 17th century visited the island much later than the commonly accepted time of the dispersal from the iguanas. We know for sure, absolutely without a shadow of a doubt, that Fiji, the Fijian crested iguana was not there prior to the 34 million years time frame uh, that is commonly accepted because of the fact that if they were, then we would have some kind of fossil record of them. Wow! But we don't. So they got there much later. Not only that, but we do in fact know that of all reptiles, iguanas are the ones that can most definitely travel across the sea. Absolutely, because we've caught them doing that before. We caught them red-handed, in fact. In 1998, a little more than 15 green iguanas washed up on the eastern beaches of Anguilla. Specifically, the iguanas had been riding uprooted trees from Guadalupe following a series of hurricanes. This means that they had ridden the tree for 200 miles for three whole weeks out at sea. No food and no water. 
well, no drinkable water. To this day, the introduced green iguana population is still alive and well, because of course they are. <laughs> Iguanas as a family are so hardy, it's actually kind of ridiculous. Out of all reptiles, they're the ones most likely to survive on a trip like that. So with that in mind, the descendants of the Fijian crested iguana taking a raft, or a raft out from Mexico, or rather Dipsaurus taking a raft out from Mexico um, and riding that all the way to Fiji, doesn't sound so impossible. Keep in mind though that this is, this is still a very rare occurrence and that it only really applies to iguanas on my islands with a few other exceptions. This is the biggest theory as to how a lot of iguanas as a whole got, got to islands. I mean Galapagos marine iguanas, Galapagos land iguanas, the Tonga banded iguanas, I could go on. This kind of event is called sweepstakes dispersal when a faunal interchange brings non-native species to an otherwise obscure location. Usually, the journey is dangerous, and only a few of them survive, hence the name sweepstakes. This is a rather uh, controversial subject among ecologists, with some going as far as to calling it as saying the theory is grasping at straws. With the quote, natural rafting is an easy, non-evidence-based solution often used to explain the presence of a variety of species on isolated islands. Non-evidence-based. I guess, yeah, I guess you could say that a lack of evidence doesn't count as evidence in and of itself. But like, overall, yeah, he's not wrong. <laughs> I mean, in the title they make specific reference to its use when theorizing the origin of mammals. This is, this is important, where they were, they were vague posting about some theories being published that the way in which ring-tailed lemurs made it to Madagascar was through natural rafting. Quote, did lemurs have sweepstake tickets? An exploration of Simpson's model for the colonization of Madagascar by mammals. So who is this Simpson's character? Well, sweepstakes dispersal was a term coined in 1940 by, don't laugh, promise you won't laugh, George Gaylord Simpson. That was when gay still meant happy, all right? Besides the point, Mr. Simpson was the biologist to coin the term, and in his paper he documents reasons as to why a species would disperse so wildly. In terms of the common reason behind actual documented instances of this phenomenon, it tends to be that an animal is displaced due to hurricanes moving things around, like the uprooted trees on the shore of Anguilla. It just so happened that there were more green iguanas clinging to the branches. So it's usually accidental. Sometimes it's more about there being a lack of food or lack of mates in one area, so they leave to find more. Here's a fun fact. The first animal to arrive at an island, usually birds or flying insects, is called a super tramp species, named after the band, the British band, Super Tramp. Take a look at my girlfriend. She's the only one I got. Now, as to why they're named after a band, I don't know. I mean, Mr. Biogeographer Jared Diamond uh, just decided to name them after a band. But when it comes to the Fiji crested iguana, they have quite the interesting history when it comes to pop culture as well. In the 1980 movie called The Blue Lagoon, there are several shots of Fijian wildlife because it was filmed in Fiji, specifically on the Fijian island Nanuya Levu. One of these shots showed a certain colorful iguana, which unbeknownst to the crew, served to be the first time anyone had seen a Fiji crested iguana on Nanuya Levu. Which, I mean, if it weren't for that movie, we wouldn't have otherwise maybe ever known that the Fiji iguana uh, actually resides on that island due to it being a private island that most researchers cannot visit, or at the very least are not allowed to visit. For now, the island where they are most common would be Yadua Taba, where 4,000 of them reside. And you might hear the number 4,000 and think, that doesn't sound like a whole lot. That's the most you can find on an island is 4,000? Yes, it is. And that sucks. It's an alarmingly small number, even for the size of the island. The number is so small because <laughs> The, these iguanas are critically endangered, with there being only 13,000 of them left in the wild. There have also been many local extinctions taking place, where in specific locations there hasn't been a single sighting of the iguanas by the locals for over a hundred years. There are still some throughout Fiji, especially on the island of Manuriki, where sightings are still very frequent. Despite this, it's thought that the species won't be able to keep their numbers up for much longer due to there being so many threats to their populations. Uh, those, you can, you can probably guess what the threats are. I mean, okay. Forest fires, the highly invasive vivai tree, which I wasn't expecting that, goats, smugglers, of course, and outdoor cats. 
Here's another reminder to keep your cats inside, please. Let's talk about the Vi Vi tree for a second. Why are they so invasive? I don't know. Actually, well, I do know. Even though they don't produce poisons or toxic leaves that could kill local wildlife, the Vi Vi tree still does have something, some way that it kind of ruins the local ecology. As it currently stands, the Vi Vi tree was introduced to Fiji as animal fodder and fuel wood. They grow quickly, they grow big, and they're very tolerant of bad or, and or dry soils. The problem is they grow so big and with leaf arrangements that are so dense that any plant underneath it will be completely blocked out from the sun and very quickly die. They're common in Mexico and in hotter areas in the United States. I've sat under a Vi Vi before. They're very beautiful. Um, and the shade is <laughs> insanely cool, especially on a hot summer day. They're great for people, but horrible for the native populations anywhere that they are invasive to, like Fiji. They are so gigantic and so hardy that any efforts to get rid of them that aren't uprooting the entire tree from many meters under the soil um, are very inefficient or just flat out don't work. Their roots reach under the initial layer of soil and down to where it's nutrient rich. So if you chop off the top, they're just gonna grow back from the roots. The way they hurt the Fiji crested iguana, however, is different. It's actually tied more so to the trees that the Vi Vi tree prevents from growing due to literally overshadowing them. Specifically, it prevents the Vau tree from growing, uh, which is a tree that produces a staple of the iguana's food, being its hibiscus flowers. What does the rest of their diet consist of? Fruits and berries, also other vegetation and fruit from native plants native plants that are also harmed the, by the Vi Vi tree. And now I'm sure you can see the problem. So basically, the Vi Vi tree, bad news in Fiji. It's fine in Mexico and the United States, but it's just really bad in Fiji. As for the goat populations, the harmful goat populations, although they were a major threat at one point, that has been somewhat resolved thanks to the efforts of the island Yadua Taba. Essentially, as domestic goats were brought to Yadua Taba in the 1970s, they decimated the wild plant populations through grazing and posed a threat to the iguanas by essentially walking into their homes and stealing food from their fridge. Not to mention the controlled fires that took place by the goat owners. When goats would escape the farms, or when there were several consecutive poor harvests for Fijian farmers, they would perform small-scale burns of plots of land. This was either to make it easier to catch the goats that had escaped or to rejuvenate the soil. Controlled burns are a very common thing that a lot of farmers do, a lot of mostly small scale farmers do, and usually the practice is fine. If anything, good and positive for the local ecosystem. But on Fiji, specifically for the Fijian crested iguana, where food is already scarce, maybe not so much. But all these fires were taking place before the government knew that Fiji crested iguanas were residing in Yadua Tama. So when they were spotted on the island, goats were banned, controlled fires were banned, and the whole island was declared a sanctuary for the iguanas. Since then, the local fauna has increased by 15%. Smuggling is of course an issue that many uh, tropical or dubbed exotic species struggle with, especially for species native to places with booming reptile trades or black market trades. But on a smaller scale in places like Fiji, it's much easier to control, um, but also makes much more of an impact due to there being smaller wild populations of basically everything. There seems to be quite the demand for Fijian crested iguanas, unfortunately. So much so that the Melbourne Zoo in Australia had to close down their iguana exhibit because people kept trying to steal them out of their enclosures. However, when it comes to people coming in and out of the island, there was an instance last year where a Fiji iguana was found smuggled through Paris in luggage and socks, as well as in 2002 when five adult Fiji iguanas were stolen from, the, from Yadua Taba. But the smuggler was stopped by Fiji Customs before he could board his flight to Germany. Now, unfortunately for the little fellas that are taken out of the island, once they're out, they can't come back in. This is mostly due to a fear of them bringing parasites from the outside world into Fiji because Fiji already has a very vulnerable ecosystem. But this is especially bad uh, when you consider the fact that Fiji iguanas, when they are taken out of the island, are taken out of sanctuaries nine times out of ten, where the populations are already very, very limited. Now before anyone gets any wild ideas, like, oh well, maybe we should just take two, a like a breeding pair, out of Fiji and breed them so that we have capt like captive bred populations and maybe we can use them to reintroduce populations into the wild. 
don't go any further, they're already doing that, kind of. They're just doing it very slowly because Fiji iguanas tend to lay clutches of four to six eggs and they have the longest gestation period out of all reptiles as a whole. Each egg takes nine months to hatch, but either way, if you really wanna help with healing the uh, wild populations of Fiji iguanas, then work with them on the island. Don't take them out. I don't know, reach out to the people who are currently working on it and I don't know, give them funding or something. <laughs> There's other ways of doing it. Overall, will the Fiji repopulation projects work? Will they be able to turn around the trends of Fijian iguanas populations? People are not optimistic. Folks say that the plan is neither cost nor resource effective. Fiji, if you want some help out here, let me know. I'm available, call me. But that'll be it from me for today. I love the Fiji iguana and I hope their population looks more promising than their past. And that's pretty much all we know about them. And hopefully we learn more in the future. So shout out to the Fiji iguana, shout out to Fiji, the island, and shout out to the Fijian people. If you live in Fiji, uh, let me know and I hope you are having a good day. Yep, that'll be all. Goodbye. Bye.